variety. So I've got everybody on mute right now, so you won't be able to talk in. But if you uh, if you have questions while I'm doing the presentation, just feel free to uh, feel free to shoot them over. So tonight um, we're going to move this out of the way. We're going to go over um, a couple major things in the golf swing that I think are really important. Um, if you hit, look here, you'll see the marks. You'll see I have the uh, kind of the highlights with that. So the thoracic part of the spine, <clears throat> the top part, kind of the middle part of the thoracic part of the spine. You'll see a highlight here with the handle of the club. Just kind of essentially that's where pressure is going to be. Um, you'll have um, the middle of the shaft, which we'll talk about tonight, which is the importance of that. I'll have to demonstrate that tomorrow. You've seen some of you players have seen um, me talk about the middle of the shaft and. And, um, and it's on the website. I'm not sure what video it's listed under, but I'll make sure that that gets highlighted and, and uh, that you'll have access to that. But because the, the middle of the shaft, as you'll see tonight, is, is um, it really is kind of the baseline of, of what we do. And, and if you can control the middle of the shaft, you can certainly, it, 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 it's the highest uh, form to getting timing whether you flip the club through impact or where you stabilize it like we teach or whatever, but if you can control the middle of the shaft, um, and that's why you'll see a lot of the drills that I do, I'll have you grip it in the middle of the club so you can start to understand the balance point, not just the handle or the head, you'll understand that middle part. And of course you see here we have the, the face or the sweet spot, which I talk about a lot, highlighted. Um, if you look down here at the bottom, you'll see uh, two little small pink ones here. and. Um, and so um, you'll see two, two lines. That's representing basically the big toe and the second toe. And I did, I think it was a public video. I don't know if it was private or public. I get confused sometimes myself. But it, So the big toe and the second toe, we'll go ahead and start with that. Those are the roots. And when I say roots, that's, what, that's where you're going to be able to, the, uh, to grip the ground primarily with. Um, you're going to have your, this, this, the strongest two toes that are going to, uh, work for you against the ground will be big toe and second toe. Then you've got the the ball of the foot, which you won't be able to see. Most people know where the ball of the foot is. And then the inside portion of the kind of the bone or structure of the foot, <clears throat> which I'll draw a little line here so you can see that. But So you have this portion of the foot, the big toe and second toe, this portion of the foot, big toe, second toe toe and then really just if you just kind of highlighted all that in right in here that's the part of the foot that all the pressure with these great players that's going to create like that root now what's a root roots so in Tai Chi I came up with rooting I didn't come up with rooting first of all um, but in Tai Chi they talk about rooting the ground and that's basically so when you're doing postures like a Wuji stance or a horse stance or any kind of your postures the feeling is, is they'll tell you, the, uh, is you're trying to dig yourself straight down into the ground like this, that you're trying to root yourself down like a fence post, like three feet into the ground. But this may uh, may not be flexed, so it really doesn't have anything to do with like, so a lot of times what people will do, they'll squat to, to get that root. You don't have to squat to get the root. I can be in, in a natural anatomical posture with my knees fairly straight, and I can be pressing and rooting against the ground. And I think there's a couple guys on here tonight that I've that I've that I've shown this to that uh, when they come to the golf schools or train with me uh, in person, um, I'll have them push on me when not in my golf swing but in anatomical posture, and they can't believe how relaxed my shoulders are. They can't move me, and it's like they said that they'll all tell you it's like it's pushing me back against them, and that is because of how I use my feet, and it's also the structure of the lower lumbar right here, which we won't be talking about tonight, but if the first part of the root starts with feet. That's what you're gripping. That's what's touching the ground. And so when most people, what will happen is in their backswing, the, the, if you control the first the first two, like the big toe and the second toe, you, and you have to feel it. So when you're practicing your golf swing and you're doing your work in front of your iPad and so forth, um, yeah, you look at your visuals and so forth, but you need to be able to feel like in your backswing um, uh, and in your downswing and through impact, are my is that connection to the ground equal and so and if it's not equal um, it, it typically like a good example somebody in a golf swing may sway out right here and so that the the foot has rolled outward and they've lost that root and so now they're working on the on the on kind of the back side of the heel um, 
could be that they reverse pivot and the weight kind of rolls this way or the back foot kind of rolls back into the inside portion of the heel again as you saw the last video that I made I think it was private but regards if you if you watch that you would notice that the heels are the weakest part of the foot as far as when you're trying to and if you're kicking and striking martial arts not but if you're in, if you're pushing against the ground it is and if you simply just take your heels off the ground and you apply uh, pressure and, and you're on your toes like you saw in the drill, you would feel there's a tremendous amount of pressure if you can keep that and turn against it. If, you, if you're in your heels and your toes are up, vice versa, there's hardly any like stability or control or power or anything. And it's really important to understand. And this has to do a lot with awareness so you really have to be you know this whole program is based on awareness I think one of our players had a good point this week that said you know your whole program is based on awareness 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 I mean if you don't have awareness of yourself nobody can help you and I think that's a good point I mean I think that's really what this is all about in regards if you take live training you know what live sessions or you come train with me here in Austin I mean it, 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 it's really about, yeah, sure, we can help you clean up the patterns, move, move you into the right positions a little bit better, or flow, chi flow better and all that, but if you don't, if you don't have that internal awareness of what you're really trying to do um, yourself, you just kind of play that cat and mouse game of one day good, one day bad, and, and not consistent. And so when you're doing this, you want to practice when you're training, just feeling that, that when you, these, the, this, this portion of the foot here, is very strong into the ground as you're rotating. Now this is the thing, here's the thoracic part of the spine. So what most people will do is they won't rotate in, they won't, so if they just root these two, two uh, the big toe and second toe like I was talking about, they won't really turn. They'll just kind of stay right there and lift their arms up to try to keep that root. The secret of it is being able to, to uh, turn through the thoracic part of the spine, keep your arms kind of somewhat in front of you in that gray area. It doesn't have to be perfect in the back swing, but somewhat around and keeping the root. Um, because what, if, as soon as you start turning through the thoracic, this is the thoracic part of the spine right in here, okay? So when you start turning through there and you're not rooted in this area right here, then you're going to see the hips kind of collapse, sway, the knees will start to break down, uh, the head may move forward or backwards, depending on just really how you move. But it's all because of the breakdown into the feet as the rotation starts. And that's why, you know, you've heard of, uh, people, I've heard golfers come into us and ask, like, you know, why is it, say, like a bodybuilder or somebody that's got all these big muscles, why can they not just, you know, crush the ball? And the reason why is they're moving in these, in a, in a forward, you know, so if you're face on here, moving forward. Most of their lifts are this way, right in front of them. In golf, we're moving laterally. We're, we're, we're doing these circles, right? And so when you start moving in circles, it's more of a test of really, in my opinion, it's not really, I shouldn't say like how athletic you are, but it certainly eliminates a lot of athletes um, because all these big muscles now are tested by flexibility. So in front of you, like if I do a bicep curl, for instance, that's in front of you. That's what I'm talking about, sagittal, so sagittal plane. So if I start working on transverse plane, transverse and biomechanics, that's rotationally like this. When you start rotating, then all of a sudden everything starts to change. You know, people that have these big muscles will typically break down, they'll kick out, they'll stand up, they squat down, because energy's like water. It's just when it's like hitting a dam when it hits these muscles. And if they're tight and they're not flowing through there, this energy, it just comes up and down and sideways and all these different, there's no stability or control. And so that's what makes golf really kind of special. And that's why you see on the tour, even a guy like Dustin Johnson, I've been fortunate enough to be around Dustin Johnson. He used to, one of my players used to practice quite a bit around Dustin at the tournaments, and so I was fortunate enough to be able to, you know, to see his golf swing, you know, two feet in front of me, three feet to the side of me, I should say, and in really close range. And um, um, you know, it was amazing. I'm still, I was always, always knew his golf swing fairly well, always thought, but then to see it up close was really special because of the fact that you just. You, he just hides his power so well. You just don't see it. And even as big as he is, I've seen Nick, Nick Fallow's a big guy. Nick Fallow can't hit it anywhere, like, I mean, relative to his size. And so when I saw Dustin Johnson, you know, it, to, he does hit it relative to his size. But because you're big doesn't mean you're going to hit it far, and because you're small, you're not, doesn't mean you're going to hit it short. 
it, it just it's amount of torque you create it also has to do with the intensity and all these things but one of the things i remember with him is is like he just he just hides his power so well it's all torque based swing it's not a speed based or snapping type motion like and i'm not trying to knock tiger here but it's not like a tiger where he you can see where he gets the power from you know it's a lot of snapping through the feet the legs and all this and the, the shaft and it's certainly worked and, that, and it's a style that will work but it also puts more pressure on the joints like the, the, the spine, the knees, and some of the other areas as well, neck. Uh, when you're torque based swing, that you're, um, there's not as much of that uh, snapping movements. And snapping movements is uh, any you know, chiropractor or PT, physical therapist would tell you, sports conditioning specialist, quick snapping movements can cause uh, serious injury. Even though we teach acceleration training and you know, everybody teaches that in sports, but there's a high risk to it. When you make a jerky, snappy, quick action, there's more risk for injury in golf. You, there's no need to do it. You know what? We're not hitting a football player. We're not going out and doing this. We're not in wrestling, doing a body slam or this. I mean, you're not having anybody punching at you like you do in boxing and all these things. So you just be smooth. No re. There's no reason to have snappy movements. And and what I believe is I teach what we call a torque based swing, which is a lot slower. And I believe equally as powerful, if not more powerful, because you're using torque to create the overall speed and not the raw force and output and so forth and that starts with the feet all right so the torque starts with the feet so that rooting we're talking about is that's the first connection you have to the ground with your feet and that's your torque all right and then so once you create that you're going to look at the depth of the hips here and this is what you want to look at on your when you're studying your your videos you're going to have to feel this is a good question we'll come back to that grant all right so you're going to have to feel when you're when 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 you're uh training with your ipad you're going to have to look and see visually if your hips, if you just, you're not going to look like Dustin Johnson. I don't look like Dustin Johnson, but you can look better than you probably currently look. So we call these rooted hips, because if you look at the depth, and we'll, I'll back this up and so you can see how he got to this, but that's a lot of depth towards this, this fan gallery back here. So if you see this gallery back here, he has a lot of range back. Now he's got that circular turn that we talk about got plenty of rotation in his hips but that's a lot more depth so if you were to come up here and push on him if he held that and said all right come try to push me over uh you're not you might be able to run into him and push him over but you're not going to be able to put your hands on him and push him over i can assure you that because of the root he's created with the ground the depth that he has in the hips and then the connection he also has with his shoulders because his body's on it's not on the same exact plane as the ball. It's actually out past the ball, but it's it's on a downward plane. And if you refer to our posture video, I think that it'll help you understand what I'm really talking about. So it's incline, being on an incline plane with your body, and being rooted in that. And uh, he certainly has it. And these great players that I'm going to uh, show tonight will they all have it. And you have to have it in the downswing. You have to be on that incline rooted posture. Not anybody that's going vertical backwards and and, and, and not rooted and light in their feet and hips and all that uh, that play have ever played the game. There's some that will go work a little up, but they're still rooted through the feet and the core. So, so <clears throat> now we've got this part. So um, we know with Dustin Johnson, he has a lot of lap, uh, the lap part of the muscles right here. So he has a lot of that, that length right here. So you see the straight left arm. You don't have to have a straight left arm. I brought Jordan Spieth on here. I'll show here in a minute. Doesn't have, it's a totally different position at the top. But the basic fundamentals will be the same. The hip depth, the, the root in the ground, and the first two, uh, the big toe, second toe, you're gonna see um, uh, the depth of the hip, the circular movement of the hips, and then you're gonna see uh, this thoracic mobility. And Jordan doesn't have that, and he doesn't need it, but the more thoracic mobility you have here, and you don't lose the root, so I don't mean by turning the thoracic part of your spine, the middle part of your spine, and, and then twisting your hips way over here and losing the foot and this and that and moving your head way off. If you click, clear uh, uh, a clean thoracic mobility is when, like for him, this just feels pretty easy because he's got full mobility, like, like he's got uh, well, hypermobile, he's hypermobile through the thoracic part of the sign, which is a blessing in that area. Um, so he just, this is like, doesn't hurt. Most people, if you put them in this, they would be in the hospital, you know, be a back injury so you don't have to have that much but if you have it it sure is nice and so that's why we talk about doing a lot of the exercises uh, specifically for the thoracic part of the spine which is the middle and that's going to be uh, you, you can refer to the site with that and, 
if you have questions on that, just send it to me by email. I can show you some specific videos that will really help you open up. You have to really dedicate your time to it because it's not about you just go in once a week and, and, and you know, go twist around and do this. It's really, you, you know, you kind of got to be dedicated to your legs and your thoracic part of your spine if you want to play great golf. Lower core, thoracic part of the spine, and legs. And I'll give you a good example, and I know I'm talking a little, this presentation is probably a little longer than, than, than some of the other ones, but I think it'll be a good one overall when we're finished with it. But, <clears throat> you know, I just got off the phone with one of our players, one of my players, has been one of my, one of my best friends here in Austin, and is Wes Short. And uh, Wes just finished up on the Charles Schwab thing and all that stuff, and he called me to talk about um, he wants to get prepared for um, next season. He felt like this season, you know, the, got away from him and uh, that you know he, I think he still made seven hundred something thousand dollars and he did all right on the champions tour but it's like the year before he made a million and he said you know the difference was like was the physical and mental training so it was the he, he, he said specifically good and, and he said you know I want to get back into where I'm fully functional through he knows all this stuff the thoracic that I get my legs stronger and and he goes, I want, and so we've had a long conversation about getting him back to where he's fully functional because swinging a golf club, this guy swung a golf club correctly forever. And yeah, we've made some swing changes with him over the years and all that, but it's, he hits it good. You could put him in the worst positions possible and he's going to hit it good because he has control of the middle of the shaft and he always will. But when he gets halfway decent with his um, body mechanics and then you put him into where you he's a he's functioning as a high-level athlete like he's supposed to whole different ballgame and uh, it's that way with everybody and he knows like you just have to dedicate yourself uh, commit to it and it's easy to get um, like for him what happened was is he just he got, gave me the story and it's easy for any of us he got into see got he trained really hard in the off season two years ago came in was tearing it up he ended up winning that year and he said you know I could feel myself I was getting lazy throughout the middle of the year and got lazy and then I finally got injured and I kind of saved the year and all that stuff but now he said you know it was going into that looking at how we train four to five days a week I I, I held up for so long and then when I quit it all together um, I just slowly broke down and so then it was relying all on his golf swing and he finally said like he did tonight even as talented as I am I felt like I couldn't do the things I could do when we were doing our training together you know the kettlebells the TRX this body weight the yoga and then he mentioned the meditation which is a big part of why he was he set a tournament scoring record at the senior uh, Q, at senior Q school is because it was it was the body it was the mental outlook and it was the way he was swing was coming to get he, his swing and his putting were coming together at the right times like a perfect storm and so it's not about like when we talked about for him was it's not about like working out hours it's about putting in 10 15 minutes if you only have 10 minutes put in five ten minutes but dedicate yourself to that weak area every day where it's going to come up and bite you and this is for somebody that plays golf for a living so us that uh, you know that want to play you know to scratch golf and so forth you can get a, a huge advantage by um, it's better to, to do the things that we do in a 10 minute session than it is to go and I'm not knocking CrossFit here but it's better than going to CrossFit and spending an hour every single day of the week and over training and over developing yourself so it, you have to be careful with over training with some players most of our guys on here don't have that problem there's a couple that probably do uh, but it's just doing something a little little bit every day and that'll help you in these areas because as our competitive nature tells us when we see somebody um, do this, I know mine does, so I'm going to speak for myself. When I see somebody do this like here, a Dustin Johnson that can move like that, the first thing as competitive as I am is I think I can do that. And that's the way most people do it. I can do that right now. I'm physically gifted enough to do it right now. Uh, you put me there, I can do it. And the truth is, not true. And it, it's because even this guy has trained for that so it, it, it requires your specific areas and just remember this and, and, and I've hit on it pretty hard but thoracic uh, glutes so your butt muscles and your lower core you hit those three areas and you can't get too good in those areas you get good in those whatever you're working on good swing or bad swing I guarantee you you will hit it better than what you currently were because those are your specific muscles for golf that's why you see golfers that don't have these big you know, monk, you know, these big arms and all this stuff, and you don't see, you know, you'll see a few barrel-chested guys out there, but it's really not about that. It's, you know, longest hitters on tour typically have the smallest arms, 
and so it tells you the arms aren't causing the the, the whip and the, the thing it, it's it's the whole body and it's the arms are just this they're really just designed to swing that's all they're designed to do and so they're not designed to be huge and big and get locked up the worst thing you can do is get them too big and too tight so we went we're going to start we went back to this the root we went to the hips the depth of the hips really look at that you'll see most of you won't have the depth that he has uh, it's not the depth that he has what here's what's confusing is it, it's deep this way but he's he still has his body angles he still has pressure on the balls of his feet so he has depth in his hips but he's still pressing forward as he's turning thoracic mobility that increases the root or the torque and that that thoracic ability here creates more torque in here which is converted which which you'll learn is like the transmission is going to convert uh, power and so it, you know most all the players will have some sort of pressure either here or here if you cock in your wrist in the transition which a lot of people do they'll kind of violently cock them this way and then back that way that makes the shaft get too much vibration that you think of this as like water it's not stable so it just kind of if you're cocking this down and up uh, as he's doing this he's slightly bending it so he's got full control of this whole shaft he knows exactly where it's at an amateur would just cock that down and cock it back the other way and lose that so it's kind of like if you can picture water in the shaft it's just going crazy it's bouncing so I've got the the uh, the highlight on the hand because there's a pressure point there and then of course we want the pressure point here now what most people will do is one or the other they'll be either they'll be either pull with these um, right here or they'll try to cast with the club head they'll either swing the club head or they'll swing the handle one of the two and that's a those are both most players have probably heard one of the two what we want to do is the truth is 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 the let me get this set up hang with me here i'm going to unwind for a second so as we come out of transition i'm going to i'm going to try to back this up the best that i can All right, so as he does, as he's coming out of transition, that's where we talk about sink and circle. So you'll see that. You'll see how he sinks down and he's circling here. And he's kind of squared, that sink and circle is squared everything up. Now, I'm going to change this up just a hair. Erase those lines. So as he does that, and you can see that, move, that club move, you know, six inches to a foot, somewhere in there, probably around a foot. So now you can see he's still rooted in both feet they're still rooted different look but both of them are rooted in the exact same angle and the spine right in the middle it's perfect all right oops didn't need to go back all right so so we're there now here's where the middle of the shaft comes into play and this can be tricky and i'll do the follow-up video tomorrow and the middle of the shaft right here now he hasn't he's going to be pushing that he's casting the middle of the shaft this way all right and you'll see it here in just a second and this can be confusing because they think well because the the shaft's going to be pushing away here and you're, you're going to think well the, the sweet spot is going to be casting well you're going to see the sweet spot does it's going to go that way it's going to go out that's not a cast because again as he's doing that he's also uh moving his hands this way he's moving them forward you'll see his hands are going to, going to be moving, the handle's moving forward as he's casting the head, which means it's going to give him control of the middle of the shaft. That's a big deal. All right, so we're going to play this a little bit. Let's see here. So you can see that. You can see the handle still moving forward, and then there's pressure, and just visually you can see it. And then for your own game, you want to feel it. You'll feel that that pressure is here. All right, and that this these hands are they're they're move, they're pushing a, they're pushing away from his body this way. This is pushing away from his body, and then you'll see on the as we go to the next as it, it continues to go, it's the same movement. It's a it's constant cast from the, basically from that area I told you. He's cast. You can really see from that last frame how the club moved away, but this is moving forward. So this hand. It's near, not near this complicated, but you, it is important to kind of see. The hand is going forward. This is casting to the ball. If he casts the club, the club head, and stops the handle, that is a, that's the kind of cast that the throwaway 
where you lose all the energy. If he if he was to only pull with the handle only this way and keep the club head going that way, that's going to be too much pull of the handle and he's going to hit a slice block, big block. He wouldn't really hit a slice block, he'd just hit a big block and he knows that. So that's why he's casting this club, the club head, he's casting that straight into the ball there. And then these, the handle is trying to, to get into a straight line as you'll see in the grip alignment point. That's all, just one movement. And it's not like he's doing this click, click, click. I mean, it's, this is happening in one shot. So, and you'll see it. So there, you'll see, oops, I'm gonna try to back that up. I'm gonna get it straight. I'm not gonna be able to stop it. Let me try it one more time. That's close enough. That's about as good as we're gonna get it. So it's see, so here, alrighty, let's see. What's my highlight? You can see there's the grip alignment point that we talk about. There's that straight line right here. So that's the pressure he's controlled the middle of the shaft. If he was to, if he had casted the club head, if he had throw away, the club head would already be over here, and his hands would be back in here. That would be, you know, where you just stop and flip. If he went, if his butt of the club was over here, and his, whoops, let me try that again. All right, so, so if his butt of the club was right here and this club head was back here, like he had all this angle, that's a block. That's, that's too much dominance of the handle. And that's why we talk about the grip alignment point. We want that straight line because you can see with everything with a scoring line, everything's in a straight line and that's what's going to control the ball. But that didn't just, that didn't just you don't just try to get it to the grip alignment point. Um, you know, halfway down in the golf swing, you're trying to, when he releases that club from, from, the, from the top, and again, it's not a, not a cast like you traditionally know of, it's a, it's a cast that is uh, moving the handle forward, and you'll have to, you probably have to see, if you don't know what that is, you haven't seen the video I'm talking about, and I've done this on before, uh, you'll just have to wait till you see it tomorrow to really truly understand it. But it's the middle of the shaft, so as he's here, as he's made a, a circle and sink, at this point, you know, he's got all this whole thing loaded completely, and he's moving that out. Okay? And so now you've got the feet of, uh, they created torque in the, in the backswing, the feet are loaded, he's got the core loaded, and, and safe, the, the spine's right here on top, you can see. So, spine is right, right there, just slight bend, but you have to have it because the right hand's below the left hand of the golf swing. So it's, that's a very slight bend. There's a lot of players, the better the players typically will move this way, which is not good. They always try to eliminate it. The other players, uh, the higher handicappers, a lot of times will move the head forward and twist the hips, which kind of gets the spine curved the other way. So you just have to kind of look at where you are with that and, and adjust it, you know, adjust it. But look at where your spine, you can always track it by just kind of right by the butt buckle to where your chest is. And you can see it's where he's at. It's very, very good. He's under, winding around a very stable spine. But from here, really, all he's trying to do now is, since he's established transition, is to um, cast the middle of that shaft from there, and again, this is all unwinding in one circle into that grip alignment point, into that straight line. And so he's taken all this torque of his golf swing, and now he's got control of the middle of the shaft, and that's really the most optimal, um, optimal way you can swing a golf club. So if you pull, again, if you pull with the handle, if you're one of those, and if you pull the handle and then control it, you've got to control the middle of the shaft through the ball, whether you're flipping it through there, um, even like a Phil Mickelson that does it a different way, he, he pulls more and collapses with his arms. He still controls the middle of the shaft through the shot. And if you don't control the middle of the shaft through the, sh uh, through the shot, then you certainly won't be playing uh, golf at that level. So, and it's not really so much as I mean, he does exactly what we like, um, I, I should say, you know, so um, 
like how the arms come through so you'll see as we come through how everything stays connected and if everything's in line even with the left arm here um, you've seen some of the videos in the past where I, talk, I show the uh, the alignment of the shaft this is not probably going to be a straight line yeah it's actually close inside the left arm if that was on the outside of the arm through here that would be a hold off if he was back this way or if it was excuse me the other way if the club head was up in this area it'd be a flip the club head was back this way and his hand position was here that would be a hold off so it's everything's based off the inside portion of the left arm and so he does really everything and you know if you look at his ball striking records i think that that speaks for itself so um i'm going to now i'm going to try this take it out of here and we're going to take a look at a couple other swings and we'll open up for questions and answers so okay so same thing with Jordan Speed you'll see um, the same exact thing. He's got the uh, the feet rooted here. The so same thing right here. Thoracic part of the spine. You can see the difference right here. I think that gives you a good um, indication of who has the most mobility. I'm not saying the best player and all that. Not, I certainly don't do that. But who has the most mobility? Um, and, and this is where Jordan feels he's most comfortable at, which is um, still more than most people have had. So you can see the bent left arm I was talking about, that's kind of style. Um, but you would see the depth in the hips, like we talked about. So we have the depth going backwards, but he's still pressed up on his toes. So he's not in his heels, so to speak. So he's not rooted, he's not pushing back, even though he's got depth that way, he's still tilted towards the ball. Uh, you can see that circle we talked about. So he's got that nice circle around the right hip. And then, of course, they all have high pressure here, and then, of course, the center shaft. So if you watch here, I'll just let it play. You can see for yourself. And just kind of watch how he pushes all these players. You can see, watch the club head pushing away and creating width in the downswing, pushing away, and the handle's moving forward until it creates alignment, a straight alignment. Stay one transition sink circles and from here he's pushing that club away from his his hands but his hands are moving forward just kind of watch how it's moving away from the hands and the distance he's creating so even if you go back look at how far that club has moved away from his shoulder you know, you'll see a lot of pictures of, uh, you know, some of the old guys like, you know, Sergio and Hogan, and they really cocked that club back and this and that. And this is where Dustin was, too, same angle. It wasn't like more wrist cock or wrist bend or whatever. That club's moving a long ways away from his shoulder. That is not the traditional, like, keep the, the shaft way back here and all that stuff. This is pushing that away to create space because it, it takes so much pressure off of, off of the overall timing. This is just, you don't have to have timing regardless, but this is so much easier to line up the shaft because you're not dealing with all that, you know, kind of superficial lag. If, you're, if it's natural for you and that's your swing, I mean, Sergio, you're not going to take it all away from him, but I mean, it's just, if, if you're natural and playing great, it's just like putting, you're not going to go in and change it a lot. But this is a much easier way for an, an amateur or a professional to swing a golf club. And you see here, both toes rooted, the big toe, second toe, a lot of depth in the hips, tilted towards the ball, spine centered, sink circle, and then he's casting again in the middle, he's moving the handle forward and casting the club head forward until they meet in alignment. Okay. Last one here, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So, a little off the uh, angle here. So, um, this is uh, Justin Rose. You can see the same thing. The big toe, second toe, great thoracic mobility. Not as much as Dustin, but it's it's up there, very high level, very clean with that. So you'll see here. Watch how he moves the club 
He's moving the club head away from his hands. He's pushing that, that middle of the shaft. That's what he's controlling right here. And he's pushing that into alignment. Straight line, maintains that inside with the left arm, and there you go. Straight down, it's very stable. He made a big change this year from trying to lean forward into, in his transition to staying more together with his, um, um, in his backswing, he used to kind of, in transition, we would lean hard left and try to press really hard into his left foot first. And then basically what he, he was taught, he ended up figuring out was he lost, he didn't, they didn't tell him, I'm sure telling him that he lost the root. But what happened was that he did lose the, the, uh, the root. And so, um, when you lean hard left in transition, if you lean hard right or hard left, you're probably going to lose one of the, the roots on the left or the right. And once he was taught to stay in both uh, both feet and unwind all together, his power really increased and his ball striking really, and as good as he was, it even improved. Um, his spin rates got a lot better. His power went up. You know, overall efficiency went up. So you can see here, you can see him casting the club away, but he's moving the handle. That's the key. you got to be moving the handle forward as you're casting that club. Okay, so I'm going to stop it right there. That's quite a bit on that, and I just wanted to show you some things that I think that you want to be uh, applying into your game. And so we'll start by, let me open this up. Everybody can speak. So if you have any questions, just feel uh, free to, to fire away. I think there was a few people that sent in some chats here, so questions. reason chat's not popping up right now so if you have any questions just go ahead and fire away hey Matt you it's Rob what's up Rob can you can you um take either one of those areas Justin Rose or um the last clip of Justin and show us from um the, the club in a waist high and a way down I'm, I'm specifically looking at how you can get the back of that front hand absolutely flat is it impact in that grip alignment setting is that is it, it, it's, not, it's not happening naturally for me I have to consciously feel like I turn it down or else it'll cut a cup a little bit yeah, so it's going to be different so for every player. The main thing is that the scoring line in the middle of the shaft is flat. So if you have the control of the, the, of the middle of the shaft and you have control of the sweet spot, let me turn this. Uh, you have control of the sweet spot there. So um, because it, it really is different. I may have to, I may have to turn some of this off. Uh, I'll just a second here. I'll open that. I'll open the uh, the questions back up here in just a second. I'm gonna pop up. Uh, let's see. Yeah. So the question was like turning the wrist down. You really don't turn the wrist down. Like I said, if you control the middle of the shaft and and you're doing little shots like you're like we're talking about zones one, two, and three, um, you're not really ever trying to turn. You're not trying because you think about it, if you're trying to turn something down, that means you're rolling it over. Same thing and there really is no roll down um, and so what that typically means is that somebody's spinning too early and and they're pulling with the handle so if they're if they're not getting the club lined up correctly then they're pulling with the handle too much which is very which I know Rob you, you, that's kind of what you do you tend to pull a good player but you know you pull the handle you're going to have to you're going to be compensating you know uh, you know pre uh, you know, big time. Actually, I mean, it's just a it's a move that um, you if you still if you can still do it. Like you can pull a handle, but you got to stabilize the middle of the shaft at some point. If you don't stabilize the middle of the shaft, then uh, there's you know really no chance of uh, being consistent. Let me go up here with Dustin here. Yeah. So when you see here. So if you watch here, if you look at how the, the radius that the club works in, I'm going to try to mute the mics here, guys. Hold on just a second. We should be good now. 
Okay, so if you look at the radius, the radius being the, the, the distal end speed of the club and how it's moving away from the hands, this is a good example. So if you're getting here, you know, right here, he's not really trying to square the club. What what happens is when you, and again, you know, you're look, we're looking at this from a from you know kind of a caddy view, but the the shot he's trying to do is, is get the middle of the shaft to get into a straight alignment right here. You know, like we talk about, which would be the you know the left armpit or the, the you know the hip or the left armpit, whatever you want to call it, doesn't really matter. But it's it's as he's hit the ball and through the shot, he wants that straight alignment of that inside portion of the left arm. I can guarantee you, he knows that he wants that. And if you tug just with this area and you're tugging and holding and you continue to hold and you're not giving this away, then that may if if, if you never ever get focused on it, then you're just going to be probably day to day because uh, your timing will be too. Um, to be two day to day. So when you get here, you get it's why it's so important to establish transition, get stable in transition with both the body and the club, and then you can start to work better. And then from here, all he's really doing, um, again, and I've said it a lot, but I think that's important. I wouldn't be talking about. It. He's controlling the middle of the shaft right there. You control that, you're controlling the sweet spot, and you're controlling this. So he's he's, and that way he's controlling it. Um, yeah, hold on just a second. Ho ho hey, hold on just a second. Ho hold on just a second, Rob. Hey, Rob, hold on just a second. I'm, I'm not, not done here. So when he's controlling the middle of the shaft here, he's, he's, he's moving that. He's casting the middle of the shaft. And as he's doing that, this handle is moving forward at the same rate of speed that he's, that he's moving the middle of the shaft away. And that's, that's how you don't have to use rotation, like trying to roll it over or roll it under or anything like that. And so if he right. if he pulls here, the same as hold, it hold on a second. Like then, dropping, yeah. out uh, the a little bit. Okay, so now let's stop. So as he's here, what'll happen is he's moving, he's casting that out, and he's moving this uh, uh, forward, and that'll end up into this straight alignment. So, so this is what it looks like. So he goes, he casts that away. That should be it. All right. So he casts, he's, he's going here, and then he, he casts the middle of the shaft, but he's moving the handle forward, and, and he's, then he can, it continues that alignment we talk about all the time, which is maintaining the face inside the left arm here. And that's just really, really, really important to know um, because, the, again, if you everybody knows if you just cast the club head and you stop the handle, well, that's a throwaway, that's a flip, and there's good luck. There's no chance. But, but you can also pull the handle, and there's a certain amount of torque that will happen inside the handle, which is great, but you still have to stabilize the middle of the shaft. I think it's easier as you stop, come out of transition, you're stable, everything's stabilized, you sink and circle like we talked about, and then you do as, as these top level guys are, like you saw the Jordan Spieth, the Roy McIlroy does the same move, the Dustin Johnsons do it, the Justin Roses, it's just a, it's, it's a very easy move to make, and that's to, 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 uh, to, to cast the middle of the shaft, and then to move the handle forward. So, and then what that'll do is allow everything to line up. And you've got to do that all the way off, obviously, to the grip alignment point, through the timing contact point, into the grip alignment point, and sustain. And it's just an easy I'm move. To, it, and that, it's, a, it's a really easy move to make. It's a very easy move to make. So, all right. So now, uh, let me see if that answers really that question. It's not about rotation one way or the other. There's no, like, you're not really trying to... Yes. Matt, there was a question on what was the best drill for that. Okay, hold on just a second here. So that drill is where you grip it. It's the lifeline, the right, the, the right lifeline. You'll see that video where it, it shows you in the middle of the shaft where I grip the middle of the shaft and I'll show you how to use the handle in the sweet spot. And that covers that. Um, and that's on the private on the on the private website as well. I don't know what stage it's in, but it's it's in there. And if for some reason it was taken out when we converted the new site, all you gotta do is let me know, and I'll plug it back in. 
I'll also have the drill for it tomorrow where I come in and show you exactly, you know, exactly what I'm talking about. And most of the guys that train with me on the live sessions, they've seen this. I know Mike's on here. He's seen it. He, he, lived, he lived it today. Uh, and but it's a very important to, to do that drill where I talk about where I grip the middle of the shaft and you start to use both the handle and the, uh, and the sweet spot. And so um, that's the best drill for it. And then you start again. I know I've said it over and over, but you, I, I, that, that's how important it is. I wouldn't be spending this much time saying the same thing over and over and over if it wasn't important. So, um, and then, and like I said, the best drill for it's not hitting balls. You need to learn how to feel it hitting balls because that's going to uh, Im improve your timing, um, obviously. But you, when you're training, you really don't have to hit balls. You just need to practice by gripping it. Um, you know, either with one hand, the right hand typically is where we show the drill, and you'll grip it with both hands. And you just practice getting it, casting it from the top and into a straight line, you know, right into the lead hip here, the grip alignment for, for us. And you'll start to feel it happen. You'll feel, because the first thing when somebody does it, the, their very first thing is like, oh my God, I'm going to cast the club. And it is a form of, everything's a form of casting. The club's going to get casted at some point. In the, anytime that golf club gets released, it's a cast. It's just a matter of where it's at. But it's not a throwaway. A throwaway is different. Throwaway is when the handle stops moving and the head cast forward, that's when you got problems. All right, so the handle you got to remember is as you're casting the club head and getting wider in the downswing, your handle is moving itself forward the whole time um, into the, like I said, the grip alignment point. And that's how it all works. And then you've probably seen some of the videos where I talk about getting the mass and momentum in time with the sweet spot. So uh, let's see. Yes. And this is Jim. Hey, Jim. If you look, if you, hi. If you look at Dustin too here, I think something that's important to see is that even though he's casting, he's throwing the club with his right arm. His left arm is still containing it and holding on to that energy. And just, just now at impact, giving it up. So his ex, his his left shoulder isn't externally rotated where he's already. You know, throwing something away into a hook, or you know what I mean? He, he's he's yeah. he's bringing it into that wall at the left side, and now just letting it out. Yeah, it's just going forward, really, for him. I mean, it's just from here you can see, he just constantly moves through forward. And so, like as he's here, I'm telling you what he feels, and he would tell you what I guarantee you what he feels is he's pushing the club wider. And one of the reasons why I know that is I know his coach, and he's one of the only guys that teaches a wide downswing. Uh, obviously, we teach a wide downswing. There's a lot of ways to do it. If you've got a great athlete that does this, they're using the middle of that club. They're not using the handle to get wide, which then if you use the handle only to get wide, what will happen is it will lock the energy up into the handle, and then it will make your hips spin out, and then that will create like a mass A on the ball, and you'll cut across it. If you push the club head wide only and you stop the handle, then the body will stop. It'll start to stiffen up because that's where we, we talked about this before. It's the super stiffening effect. So as soon as the club head moves away this way and the handle stops moving, the body will stiffen up because it's thinking it's thinking um, uh, release. And so that's why you see great players they release at the bottom. But I'm saying this is a release um, again. Yeah, sure, he's not released the club head all the way down to the hands here. That's not what I'm saying. But it's going through a form of that, and that's why it gets shallow. That's why Dustin Johnson, if you watch him and these great players I'm talking about, they don't take a big divot, yet they get extremely high-level compression. And the reason why is because when they push the club away this way and their handle's moving forward, they've got this real wide distal end speed of the club head. It's a totally different way um, to get not only club head speed but also shallow so their angle of attack with these players is very shallow through the ball and that's very important to know it gives you a mechanical advantage all this is all this stuff that we're trying to do is to give you a mechanical advantage so it doesn't you don't have to work very hard to play good golf because if you're having to work really hard to play good golf something's not right in my opinion and I think most of you can vouch for that that you see that you're not having the ones that work the hardest in the program typically are the ones that I think struggle the most um, I think it's it doesn't require a whole lot. I think you need to put a little bit of time in. You got to work your whole game, like you know it talks about and so forth. And the ones that train with me live, they know it's like I don't want you to go out and work hours on your full swing. I want you to work on your whole game if you're trying to become a, a good player. And you're going to try to putt, pitch, chip, bunker shots, a lot of wedge shots, 
uh, it re doesn't require a lot of seven iron drivers and, and three irons off the ground. And if you're doing that, I think that you'll play worse golf than what you started, in my opinion. Um, lots of little Thanks, shots. Jim. And, and so, if you will, just text your uh, chat your questions. I'm going to go through the chat the questions right now. And see, but I, I think it's really important to understand this. Um, I'll go to your your swing your question here, Grant. It's uh, I'm having a hard time pulling up the the chat right now, but just give me a second, and I'll, I should be able to pull it up. Maybe so many on here, I can't pull it up. First time it's done that, where it won't let me pull up the. I'll go back over this, and, and we may have to do it by audio. I don't want to get too much in the, We've got so many on here tonight, it's really difficult to keep the, the uh, kind of the sound out of it right now. So um, while well, I'm trying to answer the questions, but like this part, you just got to remember, you know, it's going, as soon as he sinks and unwinds here, there's about six inches where there's nothing that really happens. It just kind of goes, the club kind of stays neutral. And if you look at, if you refer to the law of the pendulum, just Google it. Don't, you don't have to take my word for it. Google the law of the pendulum, and you'll see the best way to get kinetic energy is this right here, where you, you're, you're swinging, this gets wide, and there's really no motion to it. Um, it's just getting wider, and then all of a sudden what will happen is this, the whole body will connect together. As he releases the middle of the shaft forward, or cast the club head, however you want to say it, and the handle's moving, moving down and forward into grip alignment, the mass can move forward, and that's where you're going to create momentum, torque and momentum, and into the core. Because when you spin out, what players don't realize, if you understand biomechanics, and I don't think that's really necessary uh, for everybody, but I can tell you one thing, you, the first thing you learn in biomechanics is when you spin your hips, you just lost, you won, you exposed your back, your lower lumbar, and you lost all the, the potential energy into your, your core, which is torque. So. You want to contain that torque as much as you can, um, and a great way to do that is like I'm like I'm showing right here. It's just very simple. Um, it's very na it's actually very natural. It's a very natural movement. Um, it's just that sometimes we we overkill it by you know overthinking or and I think a lot of it's just not knowing. And that's kind of what my goal is is to explain it to you. And and the best way to feel it is you'll see the drill when I show this follow up video. You'll see the drill that I give, and it's on the site. But it'll make all the sense in the world to you. And, and, and understanding how the club gets squared away through grip alignment point, you'll realize if you're having to roll the face or open the face or do whatever to the shaft, um, then you, it's because you don't understand the middle of the shaft. And then if you then if you can isolate that, then it's really just your body that you need to work on, you know, with torque or the momentum and everybody specific to that or individually based on that. But if you can get the middle of the shaft correctly, coming out of transition, look, um, and one of the players that's one of our golf schools was on here, but like, and he was here today. And it, 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 when you, we talk about when you come to a school, you've you got to establish transition. And so the establishing transition means that everything for a split second is stable. So in his golf swing, when you see it live speed, you're not going to see it. I mean, you, well, you actually will see it with a lot of players if you look hard enough, but it's going so fast back and through, it's hard to see. But the slowest part of the golf swing measured in, in, in the golf swing by the highest level players is transition. Guess what the fastest are? Amateurs. So, and what that means is the amateurs will be moving this way with their head, their body, and their club's going to be cocking down and cocking back up. So there's no stability. So while they end up with a flip, even if they're working on the grip alignment point, it ain't, it's, not, it's not going to work. And so what happens is um, you have to... Um, you have to stabilize here so you give yourself a chance. So, and, it's, and really the transition has three phases to it. And, if, and just tempo based. I'm not even talking technically. It, it goes, it, when you come into transition, it's going to be going faster coming into transition. It slows down as the part one. It stops as part two. It stabilizes as part two. And then as it moves away, the club will get wider here as it moves away for a split second, it's going to get wider this way. And then that's where you can work kind of under and through and create the mass, you know, the, 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 the forward momentum and getting the sweet spot connected together. And so um, 
that's where it's that's where it can be tricky. So you come into transition, you slow down, you stop and stabilize. That gives you the so you establish you, now you've established transition. You slowly come you come out of transition slow. And every tour player in the world, I'm telling you, if they were on here, would agree with me. They'd be saying, "Amen." They come out of transition slow. This is where the amateurs really screw up. They're trying to snap that club out of transition because they're scared they're not going to have enough power. Now, as they come out of transition, they're smooth. They've got all this torque in their core. Then they just go through. Now, that's why transition is so hard. I think 99.9% I mean, .9 of the golfers that I see, oh, I would just say 100%, I have never worked with a golfer that I have not worked in transition with. I don't care if it's Wes. I don't care who it is. I've worked with every single one of them because nobody comes to, especially amateurs, that comes to us with a great transition. Some will come slow. They'll, they might come in slow to transition. They might have this real slow, pretty backswing, but then they snap coming out, or they cock the club coming down, or they snap their hips coming out, or whatever it is, or they're moving. Most of the time, they're doing everything wrong. They're cocking the club down, they're collapsing their arms, and they're spinning their hips, and they're, they're freaking out. Uh, and so they have all this craziness. So they don't establish transition. If you don't establish transition, uh, you just, uh, you, you got, I think even with us, you got zero chance to really get a whole lot better. You might get a little bit because of the hands and short game and our stuff, but I don't care who you go to. You got zero chance because you haven't established what every pro in the world will talk about, which is what makes them a great player. They feel like they have that, that, that width and transition and that slowness and that heaviness and transition that just correlates into, you know, power and accuracy. So you come into transition slow. As it's coming into transition, it slows down. It'll stop, stabilize the body and the shaft will stop, and then it'll come out slow and wide, and then you just you move forward and get the sweet spot. You, that's where you'll start to move the middle of the shaft and the handle forward and into its alignment, and then you maintain it. And that's all you can really do. There's can be things that screw that up, but if you've established transition, you will play better golf. Everybody on this, everybody on here, if they have a better transition than to not tomorrow than what they had today, they will play. Uh, they will have a better game than that they came to us with today. No doubt about it. I promise you. So, and I'll do a video. I'm, when I do these videos, I don't try to half-ass it. I'm going to do my best to explain this as in every detail I, I've got, and I'll probably have more details as we go along down the future, but this, this is something that uh, I really believe in, and I know it'll help you. And uh, so, hopefully that answers. I don't know why I can't answer the chat, so I'm going to open this thing up to audio here, because I just... Not pop them up. So, so if you're on, Matt, you, yeah. This is Jim again. I had to uh, reload the Citrix Go to Meeting in order to get audio. Okay. You may have to do the same thing to get chat. Okay. I'm afraid I'll cancel the meeting, knowing my luck with technology sometimes. So I'll probably just keep it going. And if, if you had a question, Matt, this is Rob. I just yeah. to say that is the home run explanation of this uh, session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, and I'll show it when you get the video. I know we have a live session probably this week, or we probably need to do it this week or next week, whatever works best for you. But we'll, we'll, I know we've done a little bit with the Miller shaft. You've done the drill where you take the, the right lifeline, you take the fingers off. But I'll show you the one where we do the, uh, the, the, uh, the middle of the shaft if we haven't already done that one. Matt? Yo. Uh, Greg asked, what is the primary reason or putting mass say on the ball. Well, you don't want to. Um, the, uh, I think the main reason being that uh, the the primary is like what happens is the body spinning with most golfers. The body uh, so when we get to in, get you know in through here and it's again it's it's as a series of things that's happening because this is just motion so it's no static thing. But as it's coming through, typically what I'll see with amateurs is their hips are spinning um, or they're stopping their hips and flipping the club head. And so there's a lot of there's you, there's you know there's all these different variations um, of ways to apply you know mass a so it could be up you know so a mass a could be hitting up on the ball and tops the ball most of the time for a good player like Greg it's going to be slight it's sliding across the face um, and it is it, it go either way sliding left or right and when you do that it's just gonna it's going to affect that overall compression and then stability of shot right and so the dispersion of the shot and the ball control. Would, would you say that understanding mass A and feeling the side spin and unwanted spin on the ball, whether it's too much loft or not enough loft or too much side spin, 
would you say that that might be the primary thing that we could all gain from uh, short practice and the 10 yard shots, the 20 yard shot, the progression that we're working on? Isn't that where you're building your awareness and, and feeling that mess say and understanding that's what you don't want? Yeah, exactly. I think that's the best way to put it because at high speeds, it, you get to a seven iron drive or even a nine iron full speed, it's really hard to, I mean, you can tell it's, if you understand Massé and what we're talking about, the split, the slide uh, on the face, the ball slide on the face, you can start to feel it now that you've heard about it. And then, but it's, the swing when you get to seven iron, nine iron drive or at full speed, is it's, it's automatic and it's either good or it's bad. It's really not much you can do as far as manipulations between shots and that's why we don't teach a lot of that because it's just too hard to feel and you don't feel it and so when you can feel the ball slide on a little 10 yard wet shot I was showing a, a one of our players the guy was at school today and so um, he's was, he was hitting a 10 it was a 10 yard shot and he was hitting it I mean relative to where he started from as he would tell you that he was that ball was sliding on the face but it was so good relative to where he was. So he, as he would think, and most people would, they would see that shot and, and uh, they would say, wow, that's awesome, look at that, it's the same. But it was spinning just a little bit, but it's only 10 yard shot, because there's no speed to it. And even though it's compressed and it looked good and all this stuff. So, and then I, he started, I told him about it, I said, you're still mass aiming. And I said, watch me hit a few. And so he could see it and hear it, and then he started to go back and hit, and he was like, oh, I, I, I can feel that moving on the face now. I know what you're talking about. He started to correct that, and. The best way to do it, and, it, and, it, and it, everything started to change. The whole, the, the whole thing changed, and it's just from a ten-yard shot, the whole thing changed. But the thing, the, so you can feel it better on 10, 20 yard shots. But even thirty is hard to feel. I always tell ten yards, you can feel it. Now you don't. The thing is, most people are cutting these shots. When you're hitting this, this the ten-yard scale in our in our program, it, we're not looking for that cut spin. I want you to have probably. You may even be a cut player or whatever, which is fine. But in the ten-yard shot, I'm wanting kind of a forward spin, not a top spin without hitting it on top of the ball, hitting it solid with kind of forward momentum or some draw to it. Because I want you to feel like that ball's hanging on tight to the face. And so if you're hitting too hard down on it, the ball rolls over the back of the face. If you're hitting too hard up on it, it goes along the ground, it doesn't get into the face. If you hit solid, perfect divot level and all that's perfect, and the club's, you're sliding your hands left too much through the ball then it's going to create a mass A. If you hit the ball and you're going too linear and you're pushing your hands away and you have roll on the face, you're hitting the outside of the ball and it's sliding across, those, those are no-goes. You want to get that ball locked into the face where everything feels like it's welded for a split second. And then and you'll know, and you sometimes you may not know, but that's what your goal is to build that awareness like Jim was talking about. And that's how when you get that, then it, you just convert it up really slow. Don't try to go right through the driver go 10 yards and you start to hit these little draws and you feel it welded to the face, welded to the face, the next thing you know, 20 yards, 30 yards, 40 yards, and then, you know, when you get to a certain level, everybody knows, pull out a seven iron driver and whack a few, and, but just don't go over train, because it's there. The worst thing you do is trying to go out and just try to make it happen with a seven iron driver, because you just, it's just so hard to feel. So it's a good question though, I mean, the mass I, the slippage on the face is a big, big thing, and it's not factored in on launch monitors. So a lot of the you know, big things out there are the track man, and, and uh, we have foresight. I've had a launch monitor forever, but I don't, you know, you know, it's, great, players didn't become, so, great players didn't become great players because of launch monitors. So, so Matt, hey, this is Greg. Sorry, I, yep. I just I tried problem. to hit unmute, and I locked myself out, so I just called back in. So... Uh, Back to the mass A just for a few few seconds sure. here. Um, Twenty to thirty yard shots that you're practicing, which I do quite often. If I'm putting a fade on a shot that's that short, that's most likely the result of mass A on the club face. Would you think? Hey, Greg, I'm sorry I missed that. Will you run that by me one more time, man? Okay, so I'm practicing a twenty to thirty yard shot. Yep. Doing. I think I'm doing the drills I'm supposed to be doing, right? Yep. And if my shot in that short a distance is actually moving from left to right as in a fade, that's probably going to be explained by Massey on the club face. Yes. Yes, and you can now if you can if you can hit the cut, but try to hit it with some top spin on it. And hit it solid. And and 
Because what will happen is if it's hitting the green with what we're doing, these little baby shots, you know, these 10 yards, 15, 5, whatever it is, um, you want it to be – you, you, you don't want a lot of spin on it. What you're looking for is – in, in a real shot on the golf course, yeah, I'm not saying that. I, but for your boss, you got to remember this is all built for ball striking progression, not chipping and around the greens and all that stuff. Right. This right. is really designed to get you to take spin off your shots, to have neutral spin or more forward spin. Yeah. And um, if you know to do that, then what will happen is you'll probably start doing it. And um, it, it, it slippage on the face, though, you're probably trying to swing left as you're hitting the shot, so you're hitting it square. You're hitting some of the you're hitting the timing contact point with the soil club is really good, but as it's hitting the soil hitting that, there's some the the hand uh, the head and the hands are sliding to the left while the ball's on the face, and it, it just takes a little bit, and it'll it'll get too much backspin and side spin, and then it looks then then when you get to a seven iron or driver, it's going to be a little exposed. It won't have that, it won't progress up like we talk about. Okay, great, thank you, great explanation. Yep. And I'll I'll mention I'll put that I've got it in my notes I'll put that on the uh, list tomorrow to uh, for the video. That's a good question. Um, still can't see the chats unfortunately. Um, if anybody can see the chats, you know, feel free to throw me uh, just shoot them out there. That way uh, I can put them put them on the video and try to answer them tonight. Pat, this is Jim again. Hey, Jim. I just want to say something about, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working on uh, trying to get rid of some late flip in yep. my swing, and I'm making some progress in that. And I just want to tell everybody, you know, I, I took a step backwards in scoring a little bit, but I know I'm hitting the ball better. And I just want to mm -hmm. just tell everybody that, you know, you gotta have patience in this. You gotta, you gotta look at what you're doing and really reflect on whether what you're doing right is going to be better for you in the long run, and not get too locked up sometimes in the short term. You know, the immediate results, and just get real aware of the that it only comes from, you know, looking at the whole thing in a, in a big picture sense. And that's kind of hard to do for everybody because I know we all want to get better right now, but if you're going to get better in the big picture, sometimes you're going to take some steps back. Yeah, you know, I agree with that. I think the big thing is... Uh... You know, and most people know your story, Jim, and all that. But you know, I think the big thing when you're doing this is if you're on the uh, if you're on the webinar program and and you get and you feel like you're training hard, like I mentioned that earlier. But if you feel like you're training hard um, and you're on the webinar program uh, and you're not and you're not really improving and you don't know if you're getting stronger in your swing or not, then you're probably I'm going to go ahead and assume that you're not. And that there's there's a lot of ways around that. Um, to get better with that one is to really you know because what you don't want to do and i think jim and a lot of the players on here that are you know we've got a lot of new ones on here now but i think that a lot of the kind of the veteran players would tell you that the goal is you really do have to study whatever your program you're in the webinar program or this live training stuff or whatever the whole root of this program is based on the online program so when Jim went out and did what he did this year, won a club championship and shot 72-69, and you know the guy was just talking, you know, he would always he did it by himself. I mean, I mean, I had the program instruction and all that stuff, but I mean, I wasn't teaching him live training. I mean, Jim, you you can speak. I mean, how many lessons have we done live? Uh, have we done it? Have we ever done a Have we ever done a live training session where I'm hit watching hitting balls or anything? Not hitting balls. Uh, you watched me uh, take a couple swings in the garage one night. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that's about. So that tells you the extent of where we. So that tells you that Jim just used the. He would always refer to the program, and there's a lot of other guys that have been in the program that have done the same thing where they refer. You just refer back. I know Grant's been in here a long time. There's several others here too that that have been here. Grant's got some really cool stuff. He shot me an email a couple weeks ago playing some great golf and and has really taken off and went a long way. But like. 
you know, it, it, the guys that, that use the online program as their hub, their resource and information, not going out and trying to, and I, and I don't, I'm not, a, in, so I'm not against anybody going and trying to learn something, but when you're trying to narrow the path, most of the players on here have already been down those, that's, that road, and so um, it hasn't worked. And so all I ask is when, you, when you're on here, is really just keep the cup empty and whatever you know. I know some really good players on here, and but it, you know, it's easy to get sideways when you get information. Especially, you know, that's why one dog doesn't have two trainers. So you you just want to take what we're doing, and then when you get really good at what we're doing, yeah, get master what we're doing, but just give us a chance first, and re refer to the website to help you out. And then you have to look at your videos because you know I'm not anti-video. I I want the players to use their eyes to study. And, and look, is this? I mean, you, sometimes using your eyes is the best thing you can do. Don't talk about it. Just use your eyes and see. Do I look like that or not? And I don't mean backswing, and you know, you don't have to look like Dustin Johnson, but you should look rooted, like we talked about. You should have good thoracic mobility, and if you don't, you need to go get it. And you should learn how to apply the middle of shaft. And if you can do those things, those things are all doable. And so, but use the website to help you learn about what to do use the webinars that's going to speed up the process with what we're doing and if you feel like you're, you're training really hard and you're not getting anywhere I would suggest doing a live training session just so you get a little help I mean I mean if you get a live training session I can come in and say all right do this that's it just do that don't do all this other stuff just do this um, and it does speed up the process but you know if you need a lot of those no I don't think so I just think you just got to get what you're, uh, you need to know how you're, you need to move and if you use the iPad like Jim and some of the other ones have and built their swing that way, you'll be your own coach. And that's really the goal of this program, you know. Um, I don't, like I said, I can't see the chat um, if there's any, uh, any more questions or not. But if you have any more questions, just, just fire away. There's a question that Grant asked earlier. He said, in a torque-based swing, is club head speed limited by rotational speed of the body? Um, so, no, um, but club, did club head speed, is that what he asked? Club head speed limited, is that what he asked? Yes. So no, and I'll tell you why, because distal end speed, so if you study in biomechanics, which I have, which you don't need to do that, but like, so I'll save you a lot of headaches, but like, so distal end speed is the radius of the, the, the striking instrument. It could be whatever it would be. And so in tradition, you know, we've always heard, you know, um, you know, you pull the club into your body, you try to get that right elbow tucked against the rib cage, and you, you, know, you try to get real narrow with the radius of the swing. And there have been swings in the game that had a narrow radius and played phenomenal golf. They also control the middle of the shaft. But I believe, and this is personally, this is what I teach, I believe a wider radius um, is much more powerful because you have, this is also, you're doing mass and momentum of the club head, you're striking out in an instrument. Of course, you're doing the mass of the body too. <clears throat> so. As this moves forward in a way, you get the dis you get that mechanical advantage or biomechanical advantage of the distal end speed, then you've got the torque of the body, and then we've got the mass of the momentum going forward. <clears throat> and so when those correlate together, you, to me, that's you're going to have maximum club head speed. I would think that you would, um, because see what happens is is he starts to unwind. Let's get to where it's happening. So right in here, he's going to start to 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 release from here. Now again, it, we talked about this and I won't, I won't do it again, but like, so he's applying some, some, some pressure in the middle of the shaft and the handle's moving forward here. So he's putting some, some torque into that. And that's where, so now he's getting this real wide swing and then he's getting that, um, so he's got the distal end speed and then he's got his mass moving forward with it. So he's got radius and he's got mass. And so to me, because he's a, he's not applying one like so if he was pulling the handle all the way down into here and then he had to stabilize the shaft the the radius would get too narrow and you can still hit it a long way don't get me wrong like Nicholson has a nar narrow radius and kills it so you can hit it a long way either way but this is just more efficient and it's going to be more accurate but you know I, I, I mean J Dustin Johnson hits it a mile but there's a lot of reasons it's not just radius and it's not just you know it's because he has 
he's he's got uh, super. He's, he's an athlete. He's six foot whatever four. He's got phenomenal thoracic mobility, and he's got really strong legs. And he uses he uses. Yeah, I was his, wondering, were you doing a putting uh, session over the winter? Because we're going. Yeah. And then good rest, we're going to hibernate the snow. Yeah, yeah. You said do a putting lesson in the winter. Yes. Yes. So there'll be, as we move forward, there'll be, um, you know, we're probably going to stay with golf swing for a while because we've got a lot of new uh, new customers joining up and so forth. And so I know that they don't sign up for putting, unfortunately. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I, our stuff in putting is very, uh, I think we do okay with what we teach in putting. Um, I was trained by really, uh, you know, uh, Paul Runyon uh, himself. And so I, I like what we do there. And But it's just not, you know, I have to say it's just not sexy, you know, man. The people don't pay to, to learn putting on here, that's for sure. And if they do, um, you know, I've got it on our website and all that. But I don't really put that style, the Runyon style, on there because it's too technical. Uh, if anybody wants to learn the Runyon style, just shoot me an email, text me if you want to start learning more about putting. Um, different topics, all you got to do is tell me and I'll start. If we have a, if we have, if people want to go that direction over the winter, I have no problem. It's just going to have to be as a whole, or it'll be more like full swing. Because um, the full swing, um, I do think you can get an advantage. I mean, obviously everybody knows what I think about short game, but I, I believe that our players on the ground floor do a great job of winning tournaments because they hit the ball better. And I believe if you hit the ball better, you keep the ball in the fairways, you hit a long way, and you hit more greens, you have good dispersion hole, you're going to have a better opportunity to score better, and you're... Um, you know, and, and you less frustration. I think that's why most of the players are on here. So, but if you if there's a call to do it, I'm certainly not scared to uh, to go that route. Uh, let's see. Like I said, um, any more questions? And I'll, I'll cover the torque day swing. Um, I'll put that on the uh, on the list tomorrow too to try to explain it. But you know, you're getting the distal end speed and the mass and momentum, and um, you know, as long as you're not outrunning the club or you know losing alignment, you know, you should have an you should have an advantage for for overall club head speed because you got a real the distal end speed is you're dealing with the mass of the club head, and so it's traveling on a, on a, a wider distance than traditional. Um, you know, teaching would tell you to do it. I'm not saying you can't play good either way. You play good either way if you know what you're doing. You got control of the middle of the shaft. Matt, Matt, this is Jim again. Hey, would Jim. you say that your idea of risk cock is really important towards the difference between discipline club head speed and the traditional method of club head speed, where everybody's talking about cocking the wrists vertically? Uh, yeah, so I'll try to find a swing and, um, and, and so they can see that and maybe go over that. But, uh, yeah, I'd say it's different. Um, let's see if I can find a swing here. Take me a minute. Let's see. So uh, this is Mickelson. I'll try to find a... may not get a good... Uh, see what this looks like. I haven't seen this photo. Yeah, so this is Nicholson. He has a lot of vertical wrist cock, and so vertical wrist cock um, is, you can see what we talked about. It's kind of on the plane of the shirt like we talk about, but as he goes down one or a few more frames here, actually. This is, you would see, if I just draw a line here, um, it's kind of inside the ball. It's not really normal for a pro. More, most of the time, their shaft angle is a little flatter than that. And so that's what Jim's talking about. He's talking about vertical wrist cock is, you know, this way. That's vertical wrist cock. Side bending, like we talk in a float, would be when you side bend. If air, he can, it's really not elbow. His, his body would say the same, but if his, if his wrist were more side bend right here, his delivery would be shallower. Um, and that's what you would traditionally see on the, on the tour. Uh, and it is different, you know, so it's not as much, um, you're going to have more torque in your wrist. So, in your in your wrist, if you have more um, a little bit more side bend, and I don't 
I, I used to, t and Jim knows this, we've changed the, the, the site up a little bit because when I used to have all the components of the float on there and I had to start to kind of eliminate some of them because, you know, we weren't establishing transition, which is basically get everything to stop and build from. And so uh, I took a lot of the, the stuff about the wrist out of there because uh, you have to kind of like, what you have to look at what's going to be most important. And the first thing is like, regardless of the wrist position, we got to get everybody to establish stability so that they got a chance to uh, est establish stability through the ball, I guess is a good way to say it. Um, but yeah, the wrist, I believe, I like the wrist to be um, less cocked back towards the shoulder. And if you look at a face on, I'll see if I can find a face on, you see it gets very narrow, really opposite of what I'm teaching tonight. Um, I don't think I have one of him on the, uh, let me see if I've got it. Yeah, I don't think I have one of him face on, but you would see his radius. Most of you probably have seen his swing, and it just gets it gets pretty narrow. Um, so if I was using this player here, very good high-level ball striker, um, Malinari. So if you look, you would see it just it's just a different wrist position. It's really not elbow position. It's not any of this, and it's width. He has a lot more width away from me, but you can see the plane. It's not because he's in driver. It's that way with a wedge or seven or any of that just a, a little more shallow attack and he's got more width in his swing so when you cock the wrist back and they're vertical um, one an amateur when they do that they just they cock and uncock the club and what happens is the, it's just like a slingshot it's just there's no stability of the face they typically get a really high handle up at impact and they flip it get up on the ball around it it's just it's just not good they can't rotate because uh, through the ball because it's too steep and they don't have control again it's it's harder to control the middle of the shaft um, and so if you look at a, you know, these great ball strikers, they have that, uh, he has that width that we talked about that's pushing the club away. And so you can even see it here, how the club's working away from his arms. And so I think that answers kind of what you're re referring to, Jim. Um, do we have any more questions? It is different, like I would say, the, 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 the wrists are a little, we teach them a little bit different, and it's nothing special, I mean, the wrists are the wrist, but it is, uh, you know, cocking the wrist, you know, vertically can get you as an amateur, because we don't, uh, amateurs just don't adjust like pros adjust, and they don't, they don't have control of the middle of the shaft like the pros do, obviously, so what happens is uh, usually good things, uh, they, uh, amateurs, the, the the faster they can get that club in, in a good alignment to start the downswing and get everything synced up, the better, because they really just don't adjust uh, well enough. Um, if we don't have any more questions, we'll probably wrap it up. If we have more, uh, feel, feel free to fire away. Well, I don't see any more questions. Hold on, Robert. Yeah, okay, Robert has a question here. So he asked, uh, uh, the depth in the hips with, uh, with uh, Dustin Johnson. So let me pop that up. It, it's down the line would help you understand the depth better. Um, face on helps you understand the root, I think, better. Uh, the rooting of the big toe and small toe. So let me pop that up. Whoops. So depth in the hips is going to be, if you're an amateur golfer, if you watch how he load, he's just kind of loading up here, he really, so the depth is going to be that way. But it's not working straight back. You got to realize we're working in circles here, so don't just try to snap your hip back. But he's creating depth in the hips but he's also here's what would happen so he's he's got an angle pointing this way outside the ball that's the incline that he's on so if you want and you have to look at this and if you look at this and you refer back to this webinar and you look at this photo when you look at yourself in your backswing you will probably look like that your angles are more horizontal this way and that your hips are more horizontal and so you can't root through the feet so you're real light in the hips light in the feet and there's no really uh, balance there and so um, it's a feeling but you have to use your eyes as well sometimes you have to use your eyes so you can create the feelings but uh, 
uh, eventually it's just all feel like I can feel when I uh, if somebody's got a high level of awareness if, if you uh, with uh, Dustin Johnson or any of that uh, even just a high level amateur they can feel like if you took him and put him in a real weak position um, he would immediately know it I mean if you took him and got his hips stacked up tight collapsed his posture and got his body stacked up higher here uh, he would know that that's just there's no he, that's he's lost a lot of torque you know, and how he would explain it would be probably different than the way I explain it, but I, I can guarantee you he would not want to hit a golf ball. He likes it right where he's at, just like Roy does and all these other players. And it's all relative to what they're capable, but they all have this this angle of attack, this inclined rooted angle. So they have depth in the hips, they work in a circle, both the big toe and the, the, the second toe are rooted here, and they're inclined forward, and they haven't moved left or right. And that, that root in both feet really is the same. So... You ought to be able to feel like you're fit. you can apply really good, strong pressure in both of those feet. Not that I'm not trying to say snap into the ball or any of that stuff, but I'm just saying that you should you should be able to feel that. Uh, a chat came. There was a message that came through, but I didn't catch it. And that's all on the that that stuff's on there, but. Uh, it, kettlebell training increases this and makes it more natural, but you, you need to force it into your swing because as we get older, we fall into our heels, we, our pelvis moves forward in front of us, and our neck, will, we call it forward neck posture, all that collapsing um, uh, affects the ability to rotate. And we lose that root in the feet, we lose a lot of things, obviously. But bottom line is kettlebells, you think about it, when you swing a kettlebell, you're rooting the whole time. I don't care how you swing it, you're going to be rooting. Um, even if you're doing deadlifts or whatever you do, you're rooting your feet downward. Um, doing uh, There's yoga poses where you you do that. Tai Chi, we have a Wuji stance where you press and you create torque against the ground straight down in both uh, lateral without moving the knees, which is very important. So you learn how to create, st you learn how to create pressure with your feet without versus your knees, uh, which is very important. Um, you can get rooted by using a Swiss ball and putting it between your legs. You'll lose some of the chi flow um, with the overall swing through the shot. But I can tell you I've had a lot of success uh, with, with the Swiss ball. As a matter of fact, the guy I was talking about tonight, Wes Short, um, he, he was wanting me to write up all the things we'd done in the past. And I always journalized. I always had a journal. Uh, when we trained, you know, we used to train every day. And so I know everything we did in the peaks how we peaked up for, for tournaments and competitions and all those things. And, you know, Swiss ball was on that list. PRX was on that list. Yoga, and Tai Chi, and meditation were on that list. And, of course, kettlebells. So um, those were to get your body so that they create these strong angles like this. It, because a guy like that obviously knows how to swing a golf club. But even he knows that he loses some of these torque issues that we're talking about, some of these areas of torque and these mechanical advantages, he knows that there's times when he's training that his swing is so much stronger and more mobile than when he's not training. He loses and he can't force it. You can't just hit a, your brain and say, all right, I'm, I'm gonna, just going to turn more. Well, then you collapse things that don't need to be collapsed, like your feet, your legs, and all these other things. Or I'm going to root the ground, and I'll just do that, and then you don't turn on your thoracic. So there's an art to this, and if you understand thoracic mobility, I shouldn't say understand, but understand and you convert that into training by doing. You take that to your, your legs, your, your, your glutes, and your lower core, and you train those, and you just become a master of those three areas, and you somewhat get a little bit of better golf swing on our program, you're going to have a tremendous amount of, of success. Jim, balance potential energies. Um, so a lot of the stuff when I'm talking about hip depth, um, when you're in training and even in short shots, you should be trying to create depth like this. And I may have everybody muted if I do, sorry. But um, the depth that he's talking about over in the hips here as we move forward frame by frame, by frame you'll see how he sinks. We talk about that. And there's the circle, all right? So he sinks. He comes out of transition, he's sinking, he's circling, he's basically squared the knees back up here, he's soft, and you can see he's pushed that club away. And you can see how much depth he has, you can just tell. Most people here, you can see how inclined, I had a lesson, and Mike, if you're on here, you can feel free to jump in, but Mike and I worked on this today. 
I was really, I was really all over him. It's not, not about. I'm not trying to draw on the swing plane here, but if you look at his body angle right here, his body angle is on the same angle he's trying to deliver the club on. If you look at just, so if I take, here's the spawn, and you can just see how he's, he's, he's on his toes here. He's, he's rooted into his toes, but remember he's got all this depth here, this way, and he's got his chest down. Not many people do that. Um, well, I mean, that's why we're talking about Dustin Johnson. And so he's, he's got all these beautiful things working for his body here, and he's maximizing the shaft. And it's just, again, I think most 99.9% .9 of this is just natural in how he does it. But uh, it can be trained to do it better for what, you know, to take, to use these mechanical advantages. And this is a mechanical advantage that he has. So he's rooted through both toes. He's got plenty of flex, but see what people do, they flex the hips here. Then they'll then they'll stand the, the the chest they'll stand the chest up vertical like this so then the spine will go from here to here and then the pelvis will go this way and so then you end up you get out you get a lot of this because knee flex is not the depth he could have less knee flex than this he doesn't need it he's not going to change it but he could have a little less than that if he wanted it because the root is back here the root is here and then the chest down that's where the root and that's where the core gets contracted not by trying to contract it but because it's mechanically contracted so when his hips are deep deep and his chest is down his core gets crunched it's a, sh a shortening factor so when your uh, core gets uh, when you do a sit-up is a good example when anytime you do anything your core gets shorter and the muscle that's how you build the muscle they shorten the muscle that's how you build the muscle then as he unwinds he's gonna go long right so it shorts the long uh, sorry, somebody was saying something. I'm I'm sure there's probably some more questions on here. If there are, just fire away. Yeah, that was my, that was me. It was Mike. I mean, hey, that's right. a good visual, good visual of what we worked at. No. Yeah. So Mike, uh, you know, I worked today live, and uh, you know, I was really grinding on you to get you to do this. That probably this probably helps you more than anybody on here not to get that visual right here. Is that right? Mike, you still there, buddy? Yeah, I said, that's right. That's oh, helpful. yeah, yeah, I, I would think so. And I can send you, um, you know, his swing. I can email you his swing if you want. And, you know, it's just, I'm not trying to swing like Dustin Johnson. I'd certainly love to be able to do it. But it, you can use some things. I think he uses a lot of things that, I think there's things he could probably do better as well as he knows. But he does a lot of things really freaking good. And he makes a lot of birdies, and he's a phenomenal ball striker. And um, I, like, I like the way he swings the golf club. I'd appreciate it for second time, great. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. Let's see. Some, uh, I'm not getting the chat, so I'm sorry about that, Robert. Um, I see them when they first pop up, and then I can't read them fast enough. And it's still not letting me open it up. If you want to chat it again, Robert, feel free. I can probably catch it now, and I'm looking for it. Yes. So he wants me to go further through the shot. Okay, yeah, no problem. We just go further through. So you can see here, even back here, um, the root. So, so the strike is right. So he's used pressure. He's got both root, the root here, and then he's got the root here, and then he's really just kind of pushing off of the root. And this is getting tech, you know, a little crazy here, but that's okay. As long as you don't try to do all this stuff with your driver tomorrow, I mean, just make sure you do it. You know, it, this a lot of this stuff has to be trained in, and you, and some of it is actually wrong. But if you look, he pushes off of his root forward, and he's casting that club. He's been casting the club the whole time, and then so he's pushed off this forward, and he still kept his depth in his hips here, and he's still done a great job, as we all know, with the right shoulder on plane here. So it's your counterbalance. It's like some people say, well, your weight's on your heels or toes. Hey, look, your weight can be on your heels and on your toes, and it can be all on your toes or all on your heels. Um, you want counter. You want to be, the root is from the backside. That's why you do deep squats and you learn how to get depth in your hips. Um, Justin Rose, uh, I, I, one of my friends, a very good player, is actually Gary Woodland's roommate, and said that he had heard that Justin Rose was doing all his kettlebell training and I was like, yeah, it's just an advantage, you know. I mean, I think Gary does it too as well, but, but he, uh, he said that uh, Justin Rose, when he improved his deep squat, his whole swing and his ball striking started just from a deep squat. 
Learn how to do a deep squat. Deep squat is not easy. That's just not squatting down and lifting back up. It's c controlling the lower lumbar part of the spine, full hip internal mobility, or, or excuse me, uh, hip flexor mobility, lumbar mobility, and a uh, thoracic mobility and cervical. So, I mean, it's, it's a big movement, even though it's just a squat. But most people, when they squat, their knees collapse in, they don't root for their, through uh, their feet correctly, their, their knees will collapse one way, they rotate when they squat down, they have no idea. If you ever video yourself, I always tell everybody, when you do a squat, video it. Uh, you know, I've been there. Hey, I, I used to. <laughs> it's interesting when you even when you, it's interesting when you video your golf swing. Try to do it on when you're doing your your fitness, and you'll see see how bad your your postures are when you're going from one to another, and it gives you something to work on. And then, if you get really good with your postures and your alignments, then it and you're working on your golf swing properly, which you are here, it, they start to work together. It's not like you go try to. Um, you're going to have to try to manually do some of this stuff in your little wet shots and all that. You just have to work on it, try to add, implement it the way you want to do it and make it change. But then um, as you start to open your body up and gain more mobility and strength, uh, golf strength, you'll be able to do this. You know, you'll be able to, they start to work together. They don't, um, I don't know how to say it other than that they just start to work together. I mean, you won't have to work as hard trying to do something it'll just start to happen because your training is so the same it's really the same and that's why when, when players ask me about tai chi we, you teach me you know just basic tai chi or you know straight tai chi and i was like i can teach you straight tai chi all day long but it's it's like a waste of time because most players don't have like you know to learn tai chi is freaking like learning how to play golf it's a it's an art. It's not a piece of cake. So what I do is I revise a lot of things and try to, I try to, it, you know, I try to take everything I can from the best arts like the yoga, the tai chi, the qigong, and the kettlebells. And that I consider the people that do train kettlebells considered an art. And and you get all these forms and you just take the very best of them and you put them in one little package, you know. Because if you try to just learn tai chi, you just get all these. Man, there's. 200 plus forms, there's different styles, but even on a 20, just learning 20 forms on the Tai Chi and moving from one to the next and doing it perfect, it just, it, it's a lot of time and it's not going to be going to be specific to your golf swing. You're going to be things that have nothing to do with golf. But the movements, how you, if you learn how to, how somebody in Tai Chi moves, wherever, however they move from one spot to the next, they move a certain way. And if you can take the way you, that you're supposed to move and how you move in Tai Chi and apply it to golf, and in revise it for forms, that's where you're going to be, uh, you're gonna have something. And Grant, I know, has been uh, training Tai Chi. I sent him a, uh, a couple a uh, couple links uh, for some, a couple DVDs that I, I, I don't recommend much out there for Tai Chi, but there's a, there's a one, one, one person that I do I highly recommend um, if you want traditional Tai Chi. And I think Grant, I don't, I think it helped Grant. I think you enjoyed him. I, he could probably answer that more than I can. I don't know if he's still on here or not. But I know he's play, been playing some really good golf, so it couldn't hurt. Any more questions? Thank you, Matt. Okay, it sounds like uh, sounds like we're all good to go. So uh, I hope all you guys have a great night, and thanks for hanging in there with me tonight. And I'll send you the links tomorrow, and I will get you that video um, as soon as I can put all this stuff together. Hey, great. Thanks so much, Matt. Yeah, thanks, take Matt. care, guys. Thanks. Have a great night. Good night, Matt. Thank you. Take care. See you.